Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to the first Project Blue live chat of 2021. Today, we're joined by the CEO of Aquai, Liana Thompson, all the way in Norway. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome, and we're glad you could join us. We'll be doing a Q&A following her presentation, so please feel free to ask any questions you might have in the Q&A function or the chat below. Our guest, Liana, has a fascinating career that led her to Aquai in the fast-growing blue economy. She is a former global reporter for the New York Times and also played an instrumental role in the late great Anthony Bourdain series, A Cook's Tour. And somehow that all led her to Aquai, and I can't wait to hear her talk about that. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Liana to tell us more about her career, how Aquai started, and how Robot Fish can help save the world. Thanks for joining us today, Leanne, and uh, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jacob and Altesi, for having me. Um, yes, my life, ne I never thought I would actually have a robotics company. That's true. I did start out as a journalist, um, filing all over the world for radio and then ultimately television and was on staff with the New York Times, too. Um, but here I am now, uh, CEO of a robotics company dedicated to saving the seas. And I'm going to actually give you a little bit of a presentation about how we came to be. And I hope you enjoy the ride, the journey. Uh, you will learn about how the company was formed, how I met my partner, and how also um, we are using our robot fish to save the seas. So, Aquai is an uh, ocean tech for positive impact company. Uh, we are making uh, robotic fish platforms. Uh, yes, you heard right, robotic fish platforms to be used uh, in uh, many, many ways in various blue economy industries. Um, now, I know if you're sitting here and if you've tuned in and uh, are part of Altacy, you certainly already know a lot of these facts that, you know, how much uh, the ocean covers our, our, our planet and how it's essentially the, our force, our life force to, to existence, really. Um, and so in looking at that, you have to also take into account what's going on in today's world. So thanks to climate change, we have, you know, super storms, we have flooding constantly. We also have overpopulation and we have droughts, our droughts and, and a, a growing populace. Uh, we also have overfishing and we have uh, widespread uh, unexplained deaths of various species, including fish. Um, so indeed one can say that there is a significant ocean crisis taking place and there is a need that all of us join together uh, to save the seas, like we say here. Now, how did we come up with that slogan? And it's not just something we thought up, but actually our journey and mission to do just that uh, began with a promise. So uh, my co-founder and partner, Simeon Piotrkowski, uh, was told or asked by his daughter, Emily, to please save the seas. And that came about after she learned in school about the ocean crisis. And she was upset that she went home and she said, Dad, save the seas. So that's actually why we walk around uh, with that slogan. Now, she asked her dad, Simeon Piotrkowski, to save the seas because she actually grew up in his lab building robots. Simeon, uh, besides being a climate change expert, he was, he's also a roboticist. Uh, he had a career in animatronics and building two meter tall robots like you see here um, to study human robotic interaction. And that was you know, probably about a good uh, uh, 10, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And so Emily grew up helping her dad out in the lab and, and so when she learned about what was going on in the ocean, she thought, well, wait a minute, enough with the land-based robots, Dad. Why don't you make a robot in the, in the ocean? Why don't you make one to save the seas? And that's, um, and so she went home, as I said, and she asked him. Now, uh, you know, Simeon, being an inventor, he put his inventor head on and was thinking, okay, what kind of a system do we need um, 
to do just that, to save the seas. I mean, that's, if you think about it, save the seas, you know, it's, it's a big task, it's a big promise. And what do we need? What kind of systems are needed to be able to have the largest impact? And that's around the time that I met Simeon. Um, as a journalist, I was actually doing a story on him as like in, you know, James Bond 007. No, not Bond, but Q, the guy who made all the gadgets for Bond. So that's when I met him was doing, I was doing a story on the Q of Israel um, in the Middle East. And I met him and he was, you know, thinking about how he was saving, going to save the seas. And I was so inspired by his, by his story, by his dedication and the mission that um, when we moved to my native California, I'm a native Californian here, um, I left media and we founded a Kwai and together we, you know, I, I joined his promise, if you will, to Emily to, you know, to dedicate our time and energy uh, to the ocean and to uh, fighting climate change and the climate crisis. Now, Aquai's mission is, as you can see here, and actually this is the one slide where there are a lot of words because I want you to read it and remember it. If you're like me, you need to read to remember things. So our mission is you know, to help keep humanity alive, as it says, through sustainable environmental practices, combining risk management with biomimicry, bio-inspired. Um, we are a people, planet, profit, purpose company, and we are dead. Everything that we do is always with that in mind, um, in, in that mission in mind. Uh, we are a B2B company, marine robotics, as it says, and we're helping blue economy industries seek, you know, to have that end-to-end -end solution to protect the marine system. And that impact could be in many ways, in, in many forms, and also uh, many industries, from coastal flooding to ports and harbors, uh, for autonomous shipping, illegal fishing deterrent, um, uh, sustainable aquaculture. Uh, so these are all the different areas because we really wanted to make a system that could um, impact all of those industries, not just one, but, you know, again, it's about the seas. It's, uh, um, so we went to work on, or Simeon, I should say, actually, and I know I'll take some credit here, but he went to work on what type of a system. So we know coming out of robotics and animatronics that it had to be something that could withstand superstorms that we're seeing more and more frequent today, the flooding scenarios, rough seas that is obviously, uh, you know, one experiences in the ocean, especially in, in, in other parts, maybe not so much off the coast of California, but certainly where I'm speaking to you from today um, in Norway, the, the waters, uh, the, the seas can really get quite rough. So we wanted to make a system that could withstand this, the rough seas and swim through them and be able to swim on the surface as well as subsurface. And um, coming from animatronics, Simeon you know, started to develop different prototypes. The first one, which I'm sure you all recognize, looks like the beloved um, Nemo fish. That fish could tweet your picture. So we had cameras on there. And then we had you know, the, the black one. It was, we were perfecting more of the swim pattern and the, and the, and the, and the, and the balancing. And then the one in the, on the lower corner, um, had much more of a larger payload. Uh, when I say payload, meaning cameras and sensors. So the platform, which is the robotic fish, is a platform that carries a payload of cameras and sensors. Um, and what you might say, you know, why a fish? And as I already said, we wanted to go through, you know, the water and, and, and we wanted to be efficient as well. because. So, we were, we're drawing upon the throttle method where we're using fin propulsion, which enables us to go larger distances. Um, also the fin, uh, we do quick fin turns as well. So it's very power efficient um, using fin propulsion. So we, again, are using, upon, looking at nature, uh, are being inspired by nature when we were uh, developing our technology. Um, and of course, you know, Mother Nature, she got it right. Um, so our unit that you see here, it does, it collects data in the sense that uh, with the cameras and sensors, we're gathering various types of data, whether it's salinity, oxygen, dissolved oxygen, pH, temperature, depth, 
Um, we can carry up to 12 different sensors um, and we have three cameras on board and we, as I said already, can swim on the, on the surface or subsurface and, uh, and we get up really close to the ecosystem. So we kind of immerse with the ecosystem unobtrusively. You know, we, we, it's all about being eco-friendly, remember, and all of the parts that go into our machine also are eco-friendly as well. We 3D print a big chunk of the, uh, of the machine, um, the cameras and the sensors we buy off the shelf, um, the outer shell is SLS printed. And so we, we swim in, in fish in the wildlife adopt us. I mean, we've swam with koi, We've swam with salmon, we've swam with um, ducks, geese, <laughs> you know, various different cats love us. <laughs> um, uh, dogs bark at us, <clears throat> but we've swam with various different types of habitat. Um, and they seem to adopt us and, and swim alongside. They're not afraid. They um, we're almost like the mama, it seems, in many ways. And they, and they come right up to us. And I'll show you a film in a second. You can see that. So we, we want to gather the data um, unobtrusively with eco-friendly parts. Uh, we want to gather better data, meaning we get up close to the source. So if you need to get up close to you know, the corals, if you have a box with the, like an ROV with a cable, chances are it'll get caught. Um, and obviously, if you're looking at some of the other um, underwater autonomous vehicles out there, they're usually like torpedoes and they're really expensive. So for us, it was all about making a tool that could be good, I could use, again, I'll reiterate, uh, to multiple industries in the blue economy that uh, in, in, a, in offering an affordable solution. Um, so uh, it's really important for us that our units are, are affordable, which they are. Um, <clears throat> so I'm present to you the NAMU. Uh, she's named after goddess of the sea, NAMU as the data platform. Um, again, you'll see here there are cameras and then various sensors that that's her tail uh, that she wags. And, and again, I'll give you a tour of the lab in a second and you'll, and you'll see, you know, up close, uh, not just two dimensional now through the picture. Um, our business model, if you will, is uh, fish as a service, kind of like Software as a service, SaaS, we call it fast, um, kind of like that. Uh, and here's some of the, the imagery that, that we've gathered and we send back to the customer or who, you know, the, the, the person who needs the tool, whether it's conservation groups or, uh, or, or what, what, be, what it may be, uh, different, uh, you know, the depth, the temperature, as I said, the pH, salinity. Um, you, can, you, you actually log on to a web dashboard and you get all that information by logging on to the web dashboard. So the, the platform swims, it's gathering the data, it's going to our back end, which is pushed forward to whomever logs on and um, can get the different uh, information. You do have the ability to drive the unit if you want. So yes, there is a you know, joystick like an Xbox and you can drive it, but uh, for the most part, she's uh, autonomous. Um, she operates autonomously uh, with or without a tether. Um, and again, it gets back to what are we solving? What's the solution? Where is she swimming? So here she's able to swim up riverways in the case of flooding scenarios as well. Um, she can uh, monitor, you know, a lot of times the nutrient imbalance is coming down through the water, through the riverways before it even hits the ocean. So if you wanna talk about saving the seas, you have to also look at where some of the sources and, you know, some industry, a lot of industry now is trying to, to monitor themselves on how they can identify where nutrients are, are creating problems and where that nu nutrient imbalance is occurring. And we can identify that through the tool before it even gets out into uh, the oceans, uh, coastal areas as well. Uh, here you're looking at uh, sus offshore sus uh, sustainable farms and algae blooms. Um, smart cities, uh, more and more countries or cities are looking, you know, they already have kind of started on land with smart cities, but so many of our cities are actually on water that we also need to look at 
integrating um, aquatic or, or solutions as well in terms of the, the merging with the, the smart city solution so that we are able to provide that. This is here Budapest um, that we hope to be doing a pilot later on in the year uh, where we're monitoring what um, the water quality is uh, here in Budapest and it, you know, pretty much can be used in any, any city harbor port. Um, that, <clears throat> that water quality pilot that we're working on is also in conjunction with the European Space Agency, who looked at Aquai as, you can see a new data source. This is um, the director Gordon Campbell from the Earth Observation and Climate Change Unit of the European Space Agency, giving a presentation about Aquai. Um, on how they view us as new affordable data sources. So um, even, you know, the idea that a, a space agency could utilize our technologies, uh, helping again <clears throat> with the bigger picture and saving the seas. Um, precision fish farming, for instance, um, another perfect use case that I pointed out to a moment ago. And uh, with, with the precision fish farming, we're, we're using, you know, AI and computer vision to navigate and learn the area within the cages. And the fish there are, again, not afraid of us, fortunately. So we're able to swim right next to them and up close. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, you, you, you all have, I'm sure, heard the term, you know, precision ag or, or smart ag. It's, it's the same concept for underwater farming. Um, smart uh, aquaculture. So right now, a lot of the farms, at least uh, here in, Nor in Norway, they have cameras. They do, they do indeed have cameras um, on a pole, a static pole that goes up and down in the center of the cage. The cages are about 120 meters in circumference. And um, then they have uh, other sensors, like I've mentioned before, pH, salinity, but they're on buoys and on the side of the cage. So imagine you have all these buoys with these sensors on the side of the cage right here, where this, where, where the, you know, this um, uh, black arrow is, but all your fish are, are over here on the other side of the 120 centimeter uh, meter circumference cage. Chances are, and especially if, if it's windy or, or rainy, um, that, that the metrics are, would be completely different. So by swimming next to them and, and alongside them, we're able to get precision. Um, and therefore the farmers are able to make better decisions, whether it comes from feed, 50% of the cost in, in aquaculture is with feed. So if the fish aren't eating and they can see that through our cameras and you, know, you turn off your feeders and you save money and you, and you save waste that would gather on the bottom of that cage right down here, <clears throat> which is then polluting the ocean. So we don't want that. Um, we are you know, eating more and more farmed fish as time goes by, we've you know nearly depleted you know thanks to overfishing, um, our our wild stock is depleted, um, and right now even more. I mean that number I have here is fifty percent, but that's even higher now. I think it's uh, that 50, over fifty percent of the, all the seafood that we eat globally is farmed. Um, we're looking for other sources of protein. Um, it, you, it looks like the ocean is the, the best choice in terms of a low, the lowest carbon footprint in feeding the growing populace. Um, so aquaculture is definitely um, a, a, an industry that is going to be working more and more and more in the ocean and um, we need to, to farm that sustainably. We need to learn from our lessons in ag and those runoffs that I spoke of previously and not make some of these mistakes in the ocean and, and rather be really conscientious about how we're farming in the ocean and using sustainable systems, using precision, using IAT, IoT and data. We're working with a, a company called Quare. I know it's really hard for me to say Kvare. Um, and they also are Kvare Arctic, uh, which is also in the US. They supply 
uh, Whole Foods, Michelin chefs, they're BAP best practice certified, and we're helping them uh, get the real-time data, reduce the feed, all the things that I've mentioned before, uh, so that they are have their growing space, you know, the ocean uh, remains healthy as well as the seafood remains healthy that ultimately can end up on your plate if, if you're buying your, your salmon from, from Whole Foods. Uh, they're located near, uh, right on the edge of the Arctic Circle. I was spent the month of November there testing out our units and it was really cold and it was gale storms. I wanna say like 50 knot winds, 45, 50 knot winds. It was really a good place to test your unit. So if you're gonna do a large global impact, you really wanna test robots. Um, so we chose aquaculture as a great place to test because we're in a cage, but we're also way up here in the Arctic Circle. So we're just hammering the units and we're always telling the farmers try and break it because we really wanna be able to you know, be everywhere, flooding, like I said, or in other parts of the world, but have really, really tested these units by plowing it and in doing everything possible we can to make sure that they're, that they're durable. Um, okay, I'm gonna give my voice a break for a second. I know it's a lot of information I'm throwing at you right now. I'm gonna take a drink of water and I'm gonna share this little film. This is the team up on Kvare. Um, in, a, in a lab that we have there, um, building and testing units. So enjoy this for a second. <laughs> So, <clears throat> excuse me, this is what you see here is a lump sucker. Um, now the lump suckers are in the cages of Norway uh, eating off uh, sal uh, lice. So salmon are prone to getting outbreaks of lice. I know if, you, if you're not familiar with aquaculture, that sounds weird, but yes, same lice, lice, um, but for fish. And these lump suckers, they actually, that's a delicacy for them. So the farms, rather than using, um, you know, pest, uh, insecticides, pesticides, whatever, um, they use lump suckers. They put lump suckers in the, in the cages and the lump suckers love to eat the lice and it's good for the lump suckers. It's good for the, the salmon because then they're not, you know, being attacked and having a, a widespread of lice. Um, and so, but they love our fish too. Uh, they tend to like, jump on top of her, a lot of them actually, um, and try to catch a free ride sometimes. Um, you will see that this one has a tether. Um, excuse me. Uh, Namu has a tether here. The farmers wanted a tether on the unit so that they could have uninterrupted data feed. So normally, if you're underwater operating, you still have to, in order to transmit the data, you have to be able to send the communication out. So either we come to the surface to communicate and send, it, send out the information, or in this case, we, we hook on to the farm's uh, system with a, with a tether so that we're, we're, uh, we're sending the data and the visuals uninterrupted. So that's why you see the tether there. Let me just, oops, sorry. There we go. Um, as we are growing more and more in Norway, we opened up a subsidiary here. So we are a California company um, with Altice in California. But since we just recently opened up a subsidiary here, I'm speaking to you from Norway, where we're getting you know this subsidiary up and running to better service our customers in Norway. Um, this is our this is our our office right now in Norway. Um, 
it's dark, so it doesn't look like that now. <laughs> um, and so that's how, in short, how a robot fish uh, can save the seas. Um, so, you know, we are obviously adhering to the SDGs, uh, quite a few of them actually from, you know, light bulb, the water, everything to, you know, changing um, manufacturing because we're 3D printing. Uh, our, our units are actually recyclable, about 90% recyclable, which is also great. Um, we don't sell them, we, we lease them to people. And that way, if there's any problems, we kind of swap out the issues if there are. The units are in the water 24 seven. So when we deliver them, they stay in the water and they're doing their job without interruption. They swim autonomously, as I said. And we're always growing as a company, we're developing new things, but uh, I'll let Simeon tell you about that. And I'm actually gonna, gonna give you a little bit of a tour of, of our space here and go over to the lab. And I'm gonna introduce you to Simeon Pirokowski, who's the visionary uh, of the company, uh, the CBO. And so let's go do that. Okay. You guys with me? <laughs> I hope you're with me. I can't see you yet. So um, as I was saying, this is kind of like an old, uh, uh, the, our building here is a, a, a company, uh, family run, 237 year old family of sail makers. So they were making sails for ships. And we got lucky and found this beautiful office space um, in this very old building, um, which is just a joy to be in because you really understand how they too understand the ocean and, and also have a promise to um, treating our ocean um, in, a, in a good manner um, through, their, through their family business. So this, I'm gonna turn it the way. This is our Here's the wide shot, if you will, of the lab. Here we have our 3D printer that we use to uh, print the insides of the fish. Um, here's where we have some uh, our machining going on there. Okay. Here's where we have a stack of our robots to getting ready to be assembled. Um, every, every lab needs inspiration, of course. So here you have a lot of our uh, tools of inspiration, if you will, up there. And here you go. You have Night or 9 30 at night here so the office is a little bit empty except here we have hey guys. <laughs> the visionary himself wow. I think we lost you, right? We're back. Here, let's just move this over here. Maybe it's a Wi-Fi issue. Okay. So in short, when Emily came and approached me and said, you know, dad, I want you to save the ocean. I really had to think as an engineer, like how do you really save, solve a problem that's bigger than you? And 
for me, studying biomimicry for the last 30 years of my life and being involved in climate change, I knew that it was just a bigger problem than, than just building a fish or building a robot that could save or solve a problem. So for me, first understanding the problem, and then second, well, you know, you, you understood this, this problem, how do you sol solve it? Well, we could use conventional systems, except there's the one thing with conventional systems, they're really expensive, right? So you've got this unbelievable, everybody understands the problem, but then it all falls to a mechanical problem, right? The thing that to produce the mechanical machine, it often costs a lot of money. That's the idea of the fish. When I looked at a fish and I looked at it from a mechanical perspective, I looked at it a, an easier solution to swim through waters. And not just one type of water, but several different classes of water. Okay. Did climate change have anything to do with it? So climate change definitely did. For me, the problem is very simple. Everything that, you know, every time it rains, every time it floods, every time you throw something down the water, um, down the sink, it, it, it eventually like goes down the, a water stream into a river, from a river into the ocean. And so that in itself causes a nutrient imbalance. Today, there is really no way of pinpointing and tracking those nutrient columns that go down into a water stream, into a river, out into the ocean, which causes dead zones and coral bleaching. So the fish in every, in every shape and form is easier, is a very easy system to build, a very easy system to teach, and a very easy system to deploy, which makes it a very cost effective solution to track a given problem inside a waterway. Okay, so um, I know we're going to open up some questions in, in a little bit. We have about uh, 28 minutes left. Um, I think you know, our, the people who are, who, are, who are looking in are high school age, I understand, or, or lifelong learners, I should say, uh, as well. Um, so when you were in high school, what would you, you know, what, what inspired you to make robots in the first place, which led you to you know, focusing on a robotic solution in the ocean as opposed to, I mean, there are a lot of- I guess it was Star Trek. <laughs> no, I, I think for me, uh, robotics has always re represented something of change and pushing forward. It's always represented innovation um, to the point where if you can make something that is easy to use and makes a difference in your life, then, then, then it's really good and then it serves a purpose. So for me, the challenge in robotics wasn't so much robotics, but how do you deliver robotics and how, do you can, how can you make an impact using robotics? So what was the first robot you ever made? A robotic hand for people that had uh, amputees. That was my first project I ever did. I, I decided to use my animatron, animatronic skills and I came across somebody that had one arm and I thought to myself, wait a minute, this is simple. I can, why is it that they, people that have, or amputees at that particular time had a hand, but it was like more like a hook. So I decided, okay, well, I understand animatronics Then the basis of animatronics is to make something realistic. So my first project I undertook, trying to make a robotic hand look like the person's other hand. So I kind of succeeded in that and I moved on to studying communication and body language through the use of robotics, where I started to build two meter tall robots and immerse them just mysterious, just magically showing up to a shopping mall and placing my robot and driving it around and basically interacting with people that had no idea why the robot was there and starting to understand how body communication and how body gestures really sort of evolved. How somebody could, how a robot could show its presence and then automatically within a few seconds of a design how that person becomes used to that machine and trusted to the point where it's sharing 
a, where both of them are sharing a body gesture. So how is it different now in using a machine? Okay, let's just take that thought about um, human nature or behavior. How is understanding behavior uh, from learning from humans, how are you applying that in the ocean with fish? <laughs> I mean, for instance. It's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say the, the, the essence, so in, in a mechanical point, in, in a, I would say in the ocean, you've got, in, you've got five different swimming patterns. The, the trick is to try and mimic all those five different swimming patterns. So for example, a clownfish is a coral swimmer. A tuna is a long distance swimmer. So you, you can, my approach is to try and copy all of those movements and put them into the actual body of the fish so that we can swim in different environments, whether it's a coral reef or whether it's upstream like a, like a salmon during spawning rivers seasons, or rivers. Okay. And in fact, some of the times when we have, when we interview people to come work here, at least some of our early programmers, the question that we asked always was, well, can you think like a fish? Because if you're gonna program the fish, the robot, then you have to be able to think like a fish. And so one, one of our partners actually answered it beautifully when he said. I can, but what type of fish do you want me to, to program? Because they're all different. They all think different. So it's very true in that sentence. I have always believed that if, you, if you're going to do something, you have to see it and you have to feel it. And traditional, traditionally, you have a lot of programming programmers out there that are doing a lot of programming, but often they can't relate to the subject that they're wanting to program. So I would say over 99% of everybody that's working with us as a team, they all understand how fish swim and think, and we'll all like, we'll glance at a lump sack and a, a clown's fish, which is that small, and we'll all be mesmerized by the way it thinks, the way it moves, the way it interacts with another clownfish. Um, we have one, one question uh, here. Um, Elisa wants to know if they want, as a high school student, and they want to pursue studies in robotics, what university coursework would you recommend? So I, I, I okay, so now you're getting on my interest level. Um, I would generally advise you, and there's several links that I can send, I will up, uh, upload to the group, I would generally advise you to really start immersing yourself with the animatronic side of, of things. Because building a robot is one part of it, but the mechanical part of it, and that's the beauty of it, when you actually build something and you see it come alive, and it isn't just about two wheels and, and a square box, but it's actually more than that. It's a humanoid, or it's a, a fish, or it's a snake. So really understanding that motion, how that body moves and how that arm moves and how that gesture is coming about through your programming and through your mechanical building is, I would say, the best place to learn that is through an animatronics workshop, which you've got, this is LA, right? Mm -hmm. So you, there's, there's a lot of institutions there that specifically teach you how do you see, how do you see, how do you think out of the box? So let's talk about climate change. Now you grew up in South Africa, Cape Town, right? How did that um, affect your approach now to using robotics uh, in, in fighting the, 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 you know, the climate crisis? Well, the more I studied, the more I understood that we're gonna to get to a time where automation needs to play and into the picture. So last year, COVID, everybody was sitting at home what people really seldom understood was, well, how do you get data coming out of the, the waterways? Or how do you get data at all? And that's where automation really plays a, a vital role. So with the, the automation bit, now you can send that robot out and it actually does the job. And it doesn't, it doesn't sleep. It will just carry on doing that job until it needs a maintenance check. So robotics for you is the future to fighting climate change? For sure. It's the only way forward, but you have to do it in a very clever, clever way. Right now, the sad part about the climate 
part is that we need systems like that, but we haven't sort of sunk our teeth into cutting down the cost of them. And that's the big problem. How do you really reduce the cost to solve the problem? Okay. Um, I, I, I don't think you answered my question though. <laughs> when I asked you about growing up in Cape Town. So How growing up in Cape it? Town was beautiful and challenging at the, same, at the same time. On the one hand, we had very little, uh, at that time, robotics wasn't a big, big thing and not, not a vital part of your life, but animal conservation and conservation in general was a huge thing. Um, but what I saw was magic and the magic came through what I call African magic. So when you go through villages inside Africa, you'll see the poorest of poorest people. And in that zone of seeing it, you will see these children build these little cars and these cars are made out of tin and they're made out of wire. And from a mechanical point of view, they really, they work and they work great. And that basically taught me the discipline of really making mechanical things that actually do a lot, but actually don't cost that much. So everything, and you know, what that what that means is what, at, for us at Aquai is that everything that we're all the robots that we're making has to do has to they have to be affordable, as I mentioned before, and they have to be really simple to use so that anyone can pick it up. The farmers can can pick it up. It's not that they have to read a 200 pound, you know, 200 page manual, but they have to, uh, you know, it's simple to use. So it's ease of use and it's affordability. Uh, we have a question here about the power source. What's the power source? Well, there's no limit to the power source because the power source could be pretty much the standard is a battery. We try and reduce the battery at all costs because we don't want to, we understand the huge problem in lipo batteries which is often like mined from the ocean so we understand that point so rather than using a big battery we use a very small battery but we try and because we're utilizing a lot of patterns that fish have we can now utilize the water currents themselves so we are actually a glider in the water so we use a very we use a lot less than conventional systems so we're swimming in the Gulf Stream, for instance, even even in the, in the case of the fish farms, you know, the fish are going in circles and we're we're kind of like hooking in there and taking that inertia, if you will, and swimming uh, through a thin propulsion. We use our tail, um, you know, to glide. So, yes, we, we, we use a very minimal power source. Um, while we're operating. We have another question, this one from Sandy saying, do you, we have any partnerships with high school programs to so they can uh, watch live feeds? Oh, that's interesting. So no, we don't have any live feeds going out. Um, we, right now we are providing our customers uh, who to log on, but that's a good point that um, maybe in some of the, we have some interesting pilots coming up later on in the year, which is more yeah. an open source. That would be great. But right now where we're working, it's kind of, it's, they're owned by the farmers. So um, we're not sending out live feeds to, you know, to high school students, but what is mandated in, in Norway anyway, at three, six and nine meters is that they, the farmers have to get the data um, at those depths every day and report back to the authorities, uh, you know, about the water quality. So they're, they're very stringent about, you know, protecting the ocean and, and, you know, putting the systems in place that are mandated to report water quality. So we're helping them with that. Um, I'm hoping uh, that even off the coast of California, uh, whether it's shellfish farm or seaweed farm, that, that farming that um, sustainable practices are going to be put into place. And even further out, if they're in federal waters, if there's ever going to be a case of aqua, you know, uh, uh, sam uh, finfish farms that they, that they look to Norway and other places that have perfected the sustainable measures uh, to do that. Um, another question here. Um, Ryan asks, can we each of us tell which ocean is my favorite? Um, well, good question. Um, okay, which ocean is your favorite? Indian. The Indian Ocean? Yeah, it's warmer. 
It's warmer. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot warmer. Um, uh, I mean, you you were sur so you're a surfer, so yeah, you were so surfing nature, in Cape Town. Yeah. So the Indian Ocean. Um, I like you tend to get a lot more life coming out of that type of in, in the warm parts of the ocean. Um, for me, I'm always intrigued to see our fish swim with other fish. Specifically, I think our next big goal is to swim with sharks. <laughs> um, my favorite ocean, you know, I'm a California girl. The Pacific is always going to be my favorite ocean. Uh, I love the the waves. Um, you know, I've lived in the Medi I've lived on the Atlantic side in New York. I've lived in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, I'm always going to have my soft spot for the California coast, the big <laughs> waves of the Pacific. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I would say for myself, um, yeah, the Pacific Ocean. Um, no, Sandy, we don't have any fish monitoring right now off the coast of California. Um, that will come in the future, um, but not at the moment. So right now, um, actually recently, we pulled all the units out of the water and we're doing our next... Up, uh, our next design, actually. Yeah. Um, tetherless long distance communication um, that is a freshwater and a saltwater swimmer. So it can swim in both parallels. Um, yeah, we can go ahead, Jacob, if you want to pop back on with us and um, ask some more questions. And we have another one that just came in, a lower depth limit to our current robots due to pressure considerations. So, okay, good question, Carl. We uh, are focusing, we're not trying to compete with those who are mapping the sea or the so forth. So you want to talk about a so, so, okay, so let me ask you, let me answer the, the, the question in, in both lines. On the one hand, we, we don't really have a limit to what depth, what depth we can go because we just add a bigger pressure um, tube to it, like whether versus an aluminium or a perspex tube. Um, so the, in that respect, of, we can change as needed. However, our whole strategy is really not to map the oceans, which you, you know, to go down a thousand meters. Our game is to really try and capture nutrient levels at anywhere from zero to about 50 meters. In general, we can go around 100 meters deep. But we, you know, we can swim on the surface and do what needs to be done on the surface and go, go down, but we're not... You know, we're not trying to compete with some of those, you know, ultra expensive units that are being used, you know, in, in ONG or, you know, defense. That's not our interest. Um, we are, again, kind of looking at those industries that got left behind because they couldn't afford uh, AUVs that uh, like defense or like ONG can. Um, and those are the systems that are being used at deeper levels, if you will. So we wanted to actually offer something to all these industries who didn't have those deep pockets, but still need data, especially now as the world, you know, increasingly digitizes itself. So we're, we're you know, that get, gets back to, you know, affordable, easy to use, all those blue economy industries who want to be, and when I say blue economy, I mean the blue economy approach not just, oh, I'm, I'm doing something in the ocean or with the rivers, so I'm a blue economy. No, the blue economy approach as it was born through the UN was that you are trying, you are being sustainable on how you operate in the waterways. So it's not just operating in the uh, waterways which makes you a blue economy company. You're operating sustainably and you're utilizing, uh, you're, 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 you're still doing your business, but you're doing your business in a manner that is going to protect the environment, the marine or freshwater environment. So we're really trying to help those blue economy industries do just that, be more sustainable, give them the data that they need so that they can make decisions that would allow them to grow their, their, their business, but also act sustainably. You were going to say? I would say, I would just add to that. So having a system that's cost effective, but also easy to teach allows us to go to the poorest of poorest nations that don't have an institution of education and really employ and teach the local 
community on how really how to you know get a grasp of their own waterways but also teach the local populace and get them up to par with the idea of robotics because a lot of what's happening is and this is where there seems to be a split is when a waterway goes it really takes out the community and once the community goes there's no education so then you've got an imbalance happening so you've got an imbalance in water right and then you've got an imbalance in education so our whole strategy is really to try and create a, an every day every way shape and form a million dollar machine just at an, a really an effective flexible price point where you can go up to a nation that's developing themselves that would want to be part in, you know part of the green way but they just don't have the tool to do it so that in itself is basically impaling us to basically go there, teach the local populace, get the local populace involved, bring up the educational standard all through the robotic fish. So that's kind of like a, a bigger a bigger picture for us. So, you know, again, we're a startup. So you start small, you have a small lean team, you try to prove your technology, um, you do your tests, you do your pilots, you enter a market like we did with uh, sustainable aquaculture. You're always developing, you're always improving, you're always iterating. Um, and our broader charter for how we see Aquai, is, you know, getting back to education, because after all, you know, you guys are in school, most of you are your lifelong learners. Um, how can we also teach robotics? You know, more and more people as the world progresses. Uh, need to understand robotics. How can you teach robotics in a manner that everyone can get? Uh, you know, our robots, for instance, I told you, we 3D print uh, most of the components. So we know it takes us two days, two people to put together a robot, right? Now we went to an island with our crew, seven of us, seven 3D printers going, you know, and we like in what, six weeks made six eight weeks. robots or something like that. And we made several design, you know, design changes to to the system <laughs> while we were doing it. I mean, I think Aquai is really the, the the modern way of doing something inside the ocean tech environment. We really are challenging several different types of systems and institutions. And we're working with other institutions and other innovators and, and also universities. We're working with the Research Institute, NOFEMA here in Norway. Um, because a lot of people who are developing sensors, they want to, you know, you have a choice to put it on a buoy that's static, or you can put it on a robot fish that's swimming. And, you know, where would you want to just check out your, test out your sensor? So we're, we're always open to working with others, uh, to collaborations. Uh, we're always looking for what's, what's coming out next that maybe isn't quite like penetrated the marketplace yet, but, you know, it might be perfect for our, our technology. So, we're very kind of open in that sense. And, and we're always looking at, okay, where, where are we needed next? Um, you know, as we see more and more flooding scenarios, we're, we're developing units now for, for that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, where we are in terms of today and then where we're going. Ultimately, I wanna be able to give a unit to, to nonprofits who are doing conservation work. It's so expensive to send out a boat um, you know, and a crew and all, all of this that, what if you just took a robotic fish and it swam out there and you were getting the same data and you don't have to send the ship out and the crew. And we've been asked by scientists from the Smithsonian to make a grouper. Uh, we've been asked to work with shark conservationists. And so for me, a big part of, you know, where I want the industry to, you know, to generate revenue for me as a company owner, I still want to be able to then give back to the nonprofits and offer, you know, that 1% that we set aside can be put through a unit and then given to some of the conservation groups that would love to have a unit. And then, you know, Samin was saying also have a, have an arm one day that we're teaching robotics as well. He's absolutely, I mean, there was a reason why I was interviewing him and he's absolutely brilliant when it comes to, you know, ro robotics. And, and to answer your question, Sandy, yes, it's a combination of his mechanical engineering and robotics and animatronics. Um, I think one of the issues with just robotic approaches is that you don't look outside the box as much. Um, so when you have that combination of, 
and, and, and more and more in today's world, everyone needs to start looking about manufacturing and affordability in manufacturing too, because it doesn't make sense to make a unit that's gonna to be too expensive for anybody to use. And his background and skills has enabled us to make units that others I would, could use. I would say that just to add on to that, the biggest, the other biggest problem is yes, you can make, you know, what happens if you put a million robots out or a thousand robots out, you, you really don't solve the problem. You just create another problem. So a lot of the look that the focus that we do is recyclability. How can we actually save every bit of that robot going into the next version? I mean, that, that's where we focus. So that, there's only that 10% waste because theoretically every company that produces something and then upgrades that, you know, that machine will throw you know, a huge part of the old system away, which creates a further nightmare. So we really are focusing on every shape and bit. You know, what does it look like when you put large amounts of machines and how can you recover that? And how can you recycle that? Awesome. Okay, so we're almost out of time. You guys have uh, been amazing. Um, I have, I, we always like to end on a positive note. And so we've been kind of constantly bombarded with negative news about climate change and what's happening to our oceans. Um, and so we kind of want to figure out what, what are you guys seeing that's positive, um, either through your work or just in your research or that, that's happening in the ocean that gives us hope going into 2021? <laughs> Mr. Doomsday. No, no, okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be Mr. Doomsday. Um, positive. We're positive. Okay. I, I think there's a lot more focus now than there was, you know, two years ago. It seems everybody is trying to do something, which is a good thing. It's, it's pushing the innovation part of solving the problem forward. And that's that's where the that's where the beauty comes in because really you, the, to to solve a problem you really need to push the innovation part and I think 2020 2021 the world really saw wait a minute you know let's try and focus on the innovation because that's where it is that's the the answer and that's the key to the puzzle. Yeah, I mean, I was I agree that when we started Aquai. There were, there were, you know, the, the big players and there were a few smaller players, if you will. But now in the last couple of years, three, four years, more and more uh, people are, are doing tech or innovation in uh, the ocean. But I think that's not enough. I think where I'm a little bit more hopeful this year as a result, I think of, of COVID is that all of a sudden, those who are writing the checks too to help innovation along, which is always a problem, especially when you have, you know, imagine a robot fish, right? <laughs> um, people are now going, wait a minute, we need this. There are fun, you know, people, VCs who are now taking 30% and only about climate tech, uh, climate crisis technologies. There are those who stopped altogether doing other types of investing will only do climate investing. So I'm, I'm, what I do see it's positive is that there are not only new innovations coming about, but there are also those who enable those innovations to actually become uh, to fruition uh, that are now we're seeing more, more and more support. Um, we're going out now, you know, doing our typical round as you do as a startup. And two years ago, I had maybe a handful of people I could approach for backing this year wow, there's so many more people to approach. Not saying that they'll all write the check, but there's, there is more funding going toward these types of innovations. So that's, that's a positive. Great. Well, we are out of time, but I just wanna thank you guys so much. Um, do you guys have any final thoughts? I'll give you the floor for the final thoughts, encouragement, uh, doomsday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I mean, look, it, it's not, the, I mean, look, the biggest, the, the biggest problem we have is just to add it in quickly. The, the answer, which I think is the riddle, which you have a lot of wealthy countries that can, that can provide a lot of support for themselves. But on the same waterline, you've got a lot of poorer countries that cannot do that. 
right? So every time it floods, it, it doesn't matter how much the wealthy country is that th did their own support, you, you get the same scenario happening over and over. I, I think the more that people like Sandy stand up and say, hey, listen, I wanna learn robotics or I wanna learn something, the better it is. And more community. And, and you know, there are a lot of competition and other companies going out there, but the ocean's a big place. It'll take a village to solve the problems and we all need each other to get there, so. Awesome, well, thank you both for joining us. Um, this has been awesome. This was an incredible and informative live chat and, and quite a live chat to start off 2021. Um, <laughs> And for everyone watching, if you missed part of this or want to rewatch, you can find this recording and other live chats at altac-project-blue.org. And stay tuned for coming webinars in the next few days. Um, Timmy and uh, Liana, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Bye. Thanks for having us. Hey, you got to get your Star Trek out. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Hey, go save the seas. Bye. Thank you. And contact us, Facebook, Twitter. Um, you know, on Instagram, you can follow us there, reach out, say hi, and thank you all to see for giving us this opportunity and to meet um, all of your followers as well. So bye, everybody. Happy 2021. It. Bye. Yeah.